Does anybody know what this is? It's a, uh, a clean, safe borehole, uh, and the pump uh, that is pumping the water out of this well is a children's merry-go-round. So this is called a play pump. The idea is you, you take, you, you've got a borehole well, you've got a hand pump. Um, that's old school. You take away the hand pump and you replace it with this children's merry-go-round. The children play on the merry-go-round. And then they pump water up into this, uh, this yellow tank. Uh, you, you see the advertising on it. And then so when the, uh, when the women of the community, it usually is the women of the community, when they come to get water, they don't have to pump the water themselves. They just turn the tap and they have clean, safe water from a tap, from this storage tank. The whole thing is paid for by advertising, and um, the children also get something to play on. So it's, this is great. We got very excited about this. What a cool, innovative idea for alleviating poverty, making people's lives better. And I wasn't the only person who got excited about this. Uh, uh, you know, rappers were getting excited about it, and uh, Laura Bush was getting excited about it. I mean, Laura Bush is not a rapper. Just to clarify, Laura Bush is the wife of the former president of the United States. Um, but you know, people were, there was, a, there was celebrity interest, because it's a very photogenic kind of project. You send the guy along with a camera, and you've got the smiling children, they're playing on the play pump, and uh, that's great. And then having begun this in South Africa, we got the idea, well, maybe we could move it to, um, to Malawi. I say we, I mean the development community. So maybe, we, maybe these play pumps could be deployed in Malawi. And as you, you probably know, Malawi, landlocked, uh, less densely populated than South Africa, poorer than South Africa. Um, and this is kind of cool, innovative thinking. The, the question is, does it work? Does it work? Or is it just, is it just, are we just Mrs. Jellybee all over again? Writing, writing our letters and feeling very smug um, and actually doing no good. And it turns out this doesn't work as it happens. It doesn't work for quite a simple reason, which is that there aren't enough children in Malawi. Um, so that the, you install the pumps, you take away the hand pumps, which are actually quite efficient. You put the play pump in, which is not very efficient. One of the reasons it's not very efficient is because you have to pump the water all the way up into the water tank and it comes back down again. And um, the water tank is typically empty because there, there aren't enough children to pump the water. And so when the women of the village come along, and it is usually the women, they have to pump the water with this, um, this children's merry-go-round, which is kind of humiliating and undignified, and it takes a long time. And if there's a queue for water, that's potentially a big issue. But the, the problem was, we were, we were getting very excited about this idea. There, nobody was leaving a phone number. You know, if you are unsatisfied with your play pump, call us in Washington, D.C., and we'll put it right. There, there was no way of communicating. This was not a very effective intervention. You come in, you rip out the old pump, you put the new pump in, you go away again. Why wouldn't people be happy? And this mistaken intervention was only corrected when a Canadian engineer called Owen Scott went to Malawi and, and lived there. And so he could get the word out. He took the film of himself um, pumping with, this, um, with a play pump versus a local woman pumping with a hand pump. She takes 25 seconds to fill the bucket. He takes three minutes and he looks like a prat. Uh, you know, that was, that was the communication that was needed before the, the people who were funding these took a step back and said, OK, it was worth a try, it was a good experiment. Um, we should continue to experiment, but when we experiment, we should make sure that the experiment's actually doing some good. Um, at which point, a sort of final story. Um, this, is, um, this is one of my heroes. This is a guy called Archie Cochrane. And uh, he's a Scottish epidemiologist. And uh, Archie was a, a man who solved all kinds of problems during his life. And one of the most difficult problems he solved was during the Second World War, when he was a, a prisoner in a German prison camp. And um, he was the camp doctor, spoke good German, medically qualified. So he's the guy look, looking after prisoner welfare. And yet all the prisoners in the camp were coming down with this very debilitating condition that Archie didn't understand. It was this horrible swelling up of fluid under the, under the skin of the legs. Um, and Archie didn't know, you know was it infectious, was it, new, was it nutritional, what, what was causing it, what might happen next. Because with, um, with say, scurvy, which is caused by lack of vitamin C, you know, the, the symptoms are uh, you bruise easily, then your teeth fall out, then you die. So it was kind of important to figure out what was, where this disease was going. So he's, he's tried to solve this problem. 
in a very difficult situation and he doesn't understand the problem he's trying to solve. Now, I think most of us haven't faced quite such difficult circumstances, but most of us, I think, have faced this, a situation where we, we're dealing with something we feel we don't understand. It's our role to make it better, but we don't know what to do. And Arch's principal idea was, well, if we don't know what to do, we need to start doing things, anything, and we need to keep measuring and testing what it is that we do. And so Archie ran, in extremely tough circumstances, a clinical trial. He, he'd managed to smuggle vitamin C into the, uh, the camp. He'd managed to get hold of Marmite, which Marmite, for those of you who don't know, is a kind of zesty um, breakfast spread, looks like crude oil, uh, and, um, and contains vitamin B12, very rich source of vitamin B12. So you've got vitamin B12, you've got vitamin C, so he split the prisoners up into two groups, gave half of them vitamin C, half of them vitamin B12, very quickly discovered that this disease did have a nutritional cause, and, and it also had a cure. The cure was Marmite. Uh, and he then went to, the, went to the Germans and tried to convince them of this, and really didn't get a lot of uh, sympathy from the German camp commander, and he was just sent away. It was only then, he went back to the prisoners, he gave these last supplies of Marmite to the people who had previously received vitamin C. It was only then he went back to his room, put his head in his hands, and began to weep. Only then that he thought, maybe I'm not going to be able to solve this. But in fact, what he didn't know was that he had already solved the problem, because the evidence he had produced <coughs> was so compelling, a young German doctor picked it up, looked at all these little sketches that Archie had made in a notebook and said, gentlemen, if we don't supply vitamin B12 to the prisoners, we are committing a war crime. And so the vitamin B12 began to arrive and the prisoners got better. Uh, Archie had saved everyone's lives. Now, what's notable about that is what Archie then did next. He went on to whip the National Health Service in the UK into taking evidence seriously in medicine, not just relying on the expertise of doctors, but saying, well, do you actually know that this treatment works? Have we ever tested it? Have we ever done a clinical trial? And these days, uh, 25 years after his death, Archie Cochran is commemorated by the Cochrane Collaboration, which is an international network of doctors who take different treatments, different medical approaches, and subject them to the most rigorous possible analysis about what works and what doesn't. Now, there's a small group of researchers now in development economics who are taking the Archie Cochrane approach, who are saying, you know, we accept, we absolutely accept the need for people who are rich to help out people who are poor. That is a fundamental duty. But I'll tell you what is another fundamental duty is to figure out what works and what doesn't. And that is why trials of different development projects have become so important. I think that Charles Dickens was absolutely wrong to criticize Mrs. Jellyby for caring about what happened to foreigners, for caring about what, what happened to people who were very, very poor and very, very far away. I think he was, he was wrong then. He's much more wrong today because of what we now know about where inequality is cited and how inequality is so much a, a function of where you live. But I think he was right, absolutely right, for criticizing Mrs. Jellyby for not knowing what on earth she was doing. So let's learn both lessons, who we should care about, but also the duty to make sure that we're not doing more harm than good.